the nutrient requirement to repair tissues when you have a chronic disease is higher than if you're healthy. So my nutritional needs as somebody with MS is much higher. So we never were able to eat a lot of sugar and white flour ultra processed food because those calories displace calories that have nutrition, that have the amino acids, the vitamins, the minerals, the cofactors that we need. Therefore, what I teach my practitioners and what I teach my patients is you don't have any empty calories if you want to be healthy. You have to eat things that have nutritional value. So you can't be eating flour-based products. You can't be eating sugary drinks. You can't be eating things with sugar in them. You got to be eating these radical things known as vegetables, these radical things known as berries and some fruit. The real starchy apples and pears and bananas, though they're delicious, too much starch, not enough nutrition. Berries are good. Non-starchy plants are good. Starchy plants, a little bit. I'd be very careful about how many of those you have. And then you have to have plenty of protein. And most of us don't have enough protein. Hello, and welcome back to the Smarter Not Harder podcast, your home for one cent solutions to $64,000 questions. I'm your host again today. My name is Dr. Scout Scher, and it's a pleasure to be back with all of you. Today, I had the extreme honor of actually interviewing somebody that I've known for a long time by her work, but not by meeting her in person until recently, Dr. Terry Walls. And here's a quick introduction on Terry. We had a fantastic conversation. So Dr. Terry Walls is a clinical professor of medicine at the University of Iowa, where she conducts clinical trials. She's also a patient with secondary progressive multiple sclerosis, which confined her to a tilt recline wheelchair for four years. Dr. Walls restored her health using a, a diet and lifestyle program where she designed specifically for herself, for her brain, and now pedals her bike to work each day, except for the day when we recorded when there was 15 inches of snow on the ground. She is the author of The Walls Protocol, How I Beat Progressive MS Using Paleo Principles and Functional Medicine, The Walls Protocol, A Radical New Way to Treat All Chronic Autoimmune Conditions Using Paleo Principles, and the cookbook, The Walls Protocol Cooking for Life, The Revolutionary Modern Paleo Plan to Treat All Chronic Autoimmune Conditions. So Terry conducts clinical trials that test the effect of nutrition and lifestyle interventions to treat MS and other progressive health pro problems. And we spoke about this new trial that she's actually just now recruiting for. Uh, and you guys uh, should listen and potentially refer this over to your MS friends and loved ones as a potential way to help them. Learn more about her Walls Clinical Trials at her website, which is at terrywalls.com. She also teaches the public and medical community about the healing power of the paleo diet and therapeutic lifestyle changes that restore health and vitality to our citizens. She hosts a Walls Protocol seminar every August where anyone can learn about the, how to implement the protocol in, with ease and success. And Dr. Terry and I had a great conversation here. She really does have a fantastic way of thinking about MS and also just lifestyle and diet and even raising children where she gave me some advice during this podcast as well, which is actually very helpful, especially in how we should be cooking with our kids and how to create kids that are resilient and understand the ways of diet and lifestyle and how vegetables are important. So we initially spoke about MS etiology and the current thinking behind this. We then transitioned over to biomarkers, hormones, the microbiome, other laboratory testing that can be helpful. What I love about Terry's approach though, is that she really is diet focused. She even says that 70% of the people that work with her can get significant benefit without doing a lot of the laboratory analysis, which is pretty amazing given the lack of bioavailability of nutrients in our food, even our, especially our vegetables, but especially, but including our meat as well. We also spoke about MS and disease modifying drugs and how to taper these off of patients over longer periods of time. We then transitioned to speak about uh, her new research and what's going on in the research world and the current study that she's recruiting for, including I think about over 200 people or just about that. And she's just now finishing the last recruitment block. And definitely if you have somebody in your family or loved one that you know that has MS, would highly encourage you to go over to Terry's website and learn more about it. She has a fantastic way of conveying the real importance of diet and lifestyle in the ways of not just treating MS, but also autoimmunity, autoimmunity in general. And we finished up the podcast talking about a little bit about uh, her challenges with COVID recently and how she had a quick recovery using her protocols and a little bit of methylene blue at the same time. And then, of course, the three ways that Terry recommends we all live smarter, not harder. So I really hope you enjoyed this episode. It was really fantastic to have the conversation with Dr. Terry Walls. And without further ado, here you go. Terry, how are you today? Oh, wonderful. So good to see you. 
Yes, thanks so much for taking some time. I know you have a very busy schedule, so I'm going to get right to it with you. And it's really been a great experience, like listening to a bunch of your podcasts and doing a bunch of rereading of your work over the last uh, couple of weeks before this. And one of the ways I wanted to get started today was MS etiologies. And we know that things have changed a lot in the last several years Mm -hmm. as to what we think are the reasons here. And of course, I think there's lots of ways you can go with this, but I wanted to start off with it. Where are we in the state of research now in understanding what the causes of MS are compared to where we were, you know, even when I went to medical school 20 years ago at this point? Yeah, yes. So you have genetics that make you vulnerable. Then the next step is an infection and everyone's very excited about Epstein-Barr virus. And that certainly does increase the risk for having multiple sclerosis. But there are 15 other viruses and bacteria that increase the risk. And the reality is the vast majority of people living uh, in America and probably Western society have been exposed to one or more of these microbes multiple times. And then there is these unknown environmental factors. And that's where our conventional neurologists say, well, we don't know, so we'll just give you DMTs and then eat what you want. The functional medicine world and the integrated medicine world say, Well, we know a lot of these diet and lifestyle factors are associated with better health. So we'll have you implement all of those and we'll optimize your environment as thoroughly as we can. And then we have to Mm -hmm. watch you closely because as you do that, if you're on prescription medicines, we'll probably need to be adjusting the dose for your high blood pressure Mm -hmm. meds, your uh, blood sugar meds, and your mood meds. Because if we don't monitor, and, and this is something I was not paying attention to adequately, uh, and I came to have some people become manic because, Mm. you know, um, we didn't back down on their psych meds. And then when they became manic, they started making really bad decisions about money and sex and relationships. And so I was like, oh, my God, I got I I was not paying attention to the need to uh, back off on the psych meds so that people don't become manic. Interesting. And so what do you, so when you think about these etiologies, like there's an innumerable number of viruses, probably other things as well, fungus, bacteria, you know, as far as other kinds of etiologies, do you think that there is a top cause at this point? Or do you think it's just an amalgam of all these things? I mean, certainly there's a lot of research and a lot of interest in Epstein-Barr, as you said. Right. We're we're all very excited about Epstein-Barr. And I think it really depends on us to take a careful history, what were their right. exposures, and then investigate those exposures. Not everyone needs to have a mold assay. Not everyone needs to have toxins uh, measured. Not everyone needs all of their hormones uh, measured. But if I take a history, then I can know how deep to go in that right. uh, uh, risk area. Or, you right. know, if they have lots and lots of money and, then, and they are just deeply curious, they want to measure everything we can. But then there's an overwhelming amount of data that the patient, their eyes glaze over like, oh, my God, I don't know how to deal with all of this. So right. that becomes a problem right. for them as well. And, and that's a challenge with functional medicine in general, right? In the sense that there's a lot of things that you can test for and a lot of things that you could go after. But I know you and I were just speaking right before that you're looking at multiple very easy markers for people to, to yeah. assess in, initially and, and sort of various biomarkers to look at over time and then more complex one as well. Correct, Do you want to talk correct. about some so, of those? Well, and- the first thing I want, I want to remind everyone is in my clinical trials, I don't get to really personalize things at all. I just get to do diet. And what we find right. is 70% of our people have a great response when we fix their diet. That's extraordinary. In it medicine, if you have an intervention that works for 70% of the patients, that's like a highly effective intervention. So even if you can't test anything and you just fix their diet, their uh, mindfulness practice, uh, an exercise program, you will get a remarkable response rate. Uh, okay. So, that's amazing. So, yeah. so let's, yeah. let's do the easy things first. Yeah. Yeah. And yeah. then... Let's think about we're we're going to look for a metabolic syndrome. I'm going to check their blood pressure, their waist hip ratio, their fasting lipids. All of that is covered probably and it's probably already obtained in their medical record by their primary care doc. And you address metabolic syndrome. 
That, very easy. You could check a homocysteine folate B12. Uh, that would probably be covered in their, uh, if they have MS, uh, and optimize homocysteine folate B12. Also, again, very, very easy. You could measure the hemoglobin A1C and make sure they're not diabetic, so 6.5%. You could decide they're not pre-diabetic, 5.7 or higher. You want to get them to healthy, 5.4. You want to get them to optimal, 5.2 or less. Or you want to be a little more precise. You measure their insulin, make sure it's not above 25. Uh, that's good. Less than 15, that's healthy. Less than eight, that's optimal. Then, what about what about additional things like? And those are those are really great basics for everybody, as you said. Do you look at uh, microbiota testing? Yeah, gut testing? Actually, that's what I was just going to go to next. Okay, perfect. Yeah. So again, uh, let's think about what we could do. That's really easy. Have them have a brush, uh, a toothbrush in your office and brush their teeth aggressively. And they'll like to see, mm. is there blood in the toothbrush? So now they have uh, inflamed gum disease. They have too much inflammation. Uh, and now you can work to lower their inflammation so that the next time they come and brush their teeth, they, they don't have a bloody toothbrush. That doesn't cost you any money whatsoever. Very cheap. I love that. Okay. Uh, or you could have dental floss in, uh, in, in your office and make them floss their teeth, uh, and then, uh, rub uh, a toothbrush around. And is there blood? So blood after a vigorous uh, toothbrush or flossing, there's too much inflammation. They have gum disease, a markedly higher risk of Alzheimer's, uh, MS flares, uh, diabetes, uh, obesity, dementia. Uh, and again, this doesn't cost you anything. Or you could uh, then do a oral salivary microbiome test. Uh, Bristol has a nice test uh, and a mm. very easy to read uh, uh, dashboard that the uh, patient gets that gives them oral health risk. And uh, do they have the microbiome consistent with cavities, with gum disease, with periodontal disease? Uh, and do they have the microbes that increase the risk for a bunch of systemic health markers with diabetes, um, of, um, miscarriage, preterm labor, uh, wow. rheumatoid arthritis, autoimmune disease, uh, and cancers? And salivary microbiome, like so easy, way easier than a poop test. Not a lot of people like to poop into Pe French fry you know, containers. People, I get that, people yeah. <laughs> don't really like uh, pooping doing the poop test. And you can get a huge amount of information from the salivary microbiome test. It's so much easier. Hmm. Hmm. Uh, and it's, it has a very consumer-friendly report that's easy for your patient to read uh, and for you to go over with them and say, okay, your oral health uh, has these concerns, your systemic health has these concerns, and we're going to make these changes and we'll recheck in three months or four months. Hmm. So... And, and then you could say, okay, you still have systemic health concerns. I, I really want you to do the poop test. Or you could then say, but you have these risk factors for a microbiome problem that the salivary test can't get. And, and so mm. those kinds of things, and I'll sort of run through them, and, and probably everyone who's listening to this knows these. Um, do you have exposure to Lake or stream or pond water because you wade, you swim in it, you um, drank from it because you're a backpacker and you you drink from streams uh, and you filter mm -hmm. your water, sort of, you uh, treat your water, sort of, uh, and so you've got some risk for protozoa and worms. Or you have cats and dogs and you like them mm -hmm. and you let your dogs kiss you. I let my dogs, Especially cats. you know, I let my dogs <laughs> kiss you. We, no, most of us don't let our cats kiss us. They don't really want to kiss us that much. So that's, uh, that's, that's not uh, such a big uh, risk there, but we pet our cats and the cats lick themselves. So we still have risks for protozoan worms. 
And many of us like raw or rare, you know, sushi. Uh, we like raw or rare meat uh, or steak tartare. Um, and, you know, I, I like my steak really, really rare. Uh, and so we're at risk for protozoa and worms. Uh, and, and then if you have someone who has a autoimmune disease and you have taken the salivary microbiome test, and you've worked with them, and they their their gums don't bleed anymore. Their autoimmune disease is still not as optimized as you would like it. Now I can make a better case. You know, I think we could get more out of doing the stool microbiome, and I can look for parasites. I can look for protozoa. I can look for antibi uh, microbes associated with higher risk of uh, autoimmunity, and. Mm -hmm. Let's say I have those microbes, uh, bacteria with high risk of autoimmunity. Uh, uh, how am I going to treat them? Well, the, the best treatment is to starve them of carbohydrates. So get rid of the mm. added sugar, reduce, go on a lower carb diet, um, get the carbs to 50 grams or less. You might even want to go on a ketogenic diet. Uh, there are other people who advocate for a carnivore diet. I do not because I, you know, I'm a little frustrated with the carnivore community because they haven't published case series. You know, the easiest thing to publish of all, case reports and case series, they haven't taken the time to publish right. those so we know who they help, what are the risks, what we have to monitor, how do we get people off the carnivore diet safely. Um, I, I don't have any of that, so I'm like, okay, I just don't know how, how to use it. But but a, yeah. but a um, a, a um, lower carbohydrate diet, a ketogenic diet with twenty five to thirty grams of carbs, we we know a lot about the, that diet. We know a lot about the modified Atkins diet, uh, and so I, I'm very comfortable recommending that uh, if people have antibiotic associated uh, uh, bacteria. So we starve starve the bad bacteria. Feed mm -hmm. the good bacteria. So now I'm going to have more uh, sauerkraut, more kimchi. Uh, I can have uh, um, nut milk, uh, kefirs, uh, and yogurts. And uh, then would I give some resistant starch? You know, things like inulin. Uh, I think that would mm -hmm. be helpful because uh, I want them. I want people pooping a couple times a day. Right. And that's a, that's always a good bar biomarker on its own, yeah, right? right? How many times you're pooping a day or, and how, what does your poop look like? It, I know you have a whole stage and you have a whole classification right, of that, I right, think, right? Right. So, so, you know, the, the, um, one to six or seven, whatever that number is, the, the Bristol, uh, that's great for research, but patients don't know that, but they know rocks, logs, snakes, pudding, and tea or coffee. They get that. Uh, and you know, I tell them you want to have an easy log or a snake, but you don't want to get in your pants. And, <laughs> and they, they get that and we, we, we can laugh <laughs> together. Uh, and I say, you know, the snakes are ideal, but snakes often get in the pants. So for many people with MS, a, a comfortable log is, is a better way to go. Yeah, I got that. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, and then with other types of testing, I know that you've talked about hormone testing yeah. before. What do you think the utility of hormone testing is and what so, kind, of, kind of patient population would you be thinking about? So that? people with uh, multiple sclerosis, we have higher rates of early menopause. Uh, and I'm talking menopause in your 30s, perimenopause in your 30s, higher rates of early and depause. Now the guys, uh, with what they see is insulin resistance, fatigue, uh, um, irritability, uh, low energy. So I, I really like to get uh, an estrogen, testosterone, uh, free estrogen, free testosterone. Uh, um, and in all of my MS patients, and I have a low threshold for getting a follicle stimulating hormone and a luteinizing hormone to uh, um, ferret out, are we getting to menopause, uh, andropause? Uh, and then you can have a debate, do I use um, bioidentical hormones, uh, mm -hmm. creams or pellets. Uh, do I do plant-based uh, estrogens? Uh, do I do uh, Malaysian 
ginseng uh, for the guys. And that will depend on uh, the person, their comfort level. Um, I, I don't do pellet therapy. Um, uh, I'll sure. refer them to someone else who can manage either the pellets uh, or the topical uh, hormones. Sure. It, you know, and my preference is, you know, I don't want people to have hormones. You know, hormones are good for our brains. So, it, and so we do have a, con a conversation that there's a uh, controversy and some people are um, uh, reluctant. Uh, um, uh, mm -hmm. And the primary care person's going to be very nervous about a hormone replacement because of increased cancer risk, cardiovascular risk. Um, uh, and I uh, discuss the concerns that get generated because of the Women's Health Initiative and that those concerns are have been diminished. Uh, and they so, have been, yeah. I, and I explained that I I made I personally made the decision that I would rather have hormone therapy uh, and a right. vigorous brain. Indeed. Uh, so, I, um, but uh, that everyone we all have. Uh, uh, we all have to decide what risks uh, we are most comfortable with. Yeah, I think that's a really good good call. And I know a lot of those early studies or the Women's Health Initiative studies were related to not bioidenticals, but other synthetic estrogens and progestins, for example. Synthetic estrogens, and synthetic with progesterones, yeah. or horse yeah. urine. Yes, or horse, or horse derived, yeah. And I would imagine, you know, the reason for the early menopause or the early andropause really in men would be related to what's going on sort of underlying, right? right. In the sense it's, of inflammation. It's the autoimmune attack of the ovaries, autoimmune attack uh, <clears throat> of the uh, testicles. Right. So in that case, if you're improving those autoimmune uh, ecosystem, right, because you're improving the diet, the lifestyle, looking at markers, do you t tend to see that some of these things will get better sort well, of quote unquote on their own? Uh, they they do often this? do. As a matter of fact, it's very common for both men and women to have uh, infertility. Mm -hmm. And for many of our patients, they wanted to have kids and were unable to have kids. Sure. So, you know, they quit do, using contraception because then you're like, okay, it's, it's just not going to happen. And they get pregnant. <laughs> and, and then <laughs> Because they're working with you. And, and they're working with me. <laughs> and, and then in my clinical trials, when people enroll in my studies, you always have to say, no, uh, you, you can only enroll if you're not, not planning to get pregnant in the next two. And then sure. my current saying for the next two years. We have three unplanned pregnancies. So the first one, like, okay. The second one, I reported to the IRB. The third one, I had to report to the IRB. So we had to notify all of our, all of our patients. I had to modify my sure. uh, consent to say, and one of the unanticipated um, side effects is that your fertility may improve. So even if you've been told that you were infertile, we're going wow. to ask that you use contraception. Uh, and talk to your primary care team, your medical team about the contraception yeah. that is correct for you. And if you're a man in my study, we, then we tell you that you may, you know, you need to know that your spouse may be more fertile. So you're, you need to use contraception if you aren't, weren't planning on your spouse having more kids. And that's okay. And by the way, you, children in your household will be more fertile too. The children. Well, yeah, because, you know, teenagers, you know, they're out having sex and they're pretty fertile anyway. <laughs> but but I wanted to remind them that the whole family is more fertile. Well, I guess this kind of goes along with changing the diet and the lifestyle of the whole family. Right. right? So, so as you're optimizing. We, we, we yeah. stress when you're in our clinical trials and also stress this in my clinics that people who do this as a family are very successful. So right. if the family agrees, we're going to. At the family dinner table, supper table, breakfast table, we're going to eat food mm -hmm. that, you know, is health supportive and we'll take food away that is health destructive. And now other members of the family get to eat what they want when they're not with the patient. But when you're with the patient, with the patient, we want the patient to see is food that is good for them. Uh, and so they should not have to see and preferably not have to smell food that is not good for them, but away from them. So I, I encourage families to have the conversation like, okay, um, spouse really likes pasta, Italian meals. Um, so if they're going to have a pasta meal, the patient goes out with their friends 
to do something special. And the other members of the household that really like pasta, they'll eat their pasta and, and cheese and have a you know a lovely meal. They will not talk about it when the patient gets home. Mm. And the patient like has uh, you know a lovely time uh, with their friends. So we want to be supportive to the f- other members of the family who don't feel the need to make the diet changes. We want to be supportive to the patient. Uh, and we have to find a way that Everybody feels validated, loved, and supported. Yeah, that's a ama- that's a really important thing. I mean, obviously, when you have teenagers, uh, when they leave the house, it's it's kind of anybody's they're guess what they do. But yeah. what are they going to do? But at the house, yeah. I mean, I have a thirteen year old, and I'm already getting that. So <laughs> they're going to do what they're going to do. You yeah. just have to let go of yeah. it and and talk a lot yeah. about why you do what you yeah. do. Right. And. Um, what what is super interesting, you know, my, my kids are much older now. They're in their uh, 20s, Zach's in his 30s. And they talk about how they heard my words coming out of their mouth talking to their friends. Yes, yes. This is what happened with me and my father. And my father is a chiropractor for 40 years. And I hear myself talking like him now. And I, I mean, it's the modeling, right? right? That's the modeling of behavior that we talk about. So I love that. Yeah. So if you, but you have to let go of it, you have to be truly willing to let go of it. Then that can happen. If you don't let go of it, then by God, they will not do that stuff. Yeah. That's great advice. I appreciate that. As I'm going through my teenage years, it's my first of four. I figured uh, so you're going to be very stupid for a long time. <laughs> Well, I appreciate that, but I can just call you Terry and say, what am I doing wrong? But, um, yeah, it was funny when you were talking about the fertility stuff just a minute ago, I was thinking, well, maybe that's a great side business for you. You can like open up a fertility clinic clinic for MS patients right next to your clinic in Iowa. And then, you know, everybody's going to come down there and want to have babies at the same time as getting the walls protocol. You know, um, we, we certainly have seen this time and time again, uh, in my uh, private practice. I know when I was, uh, giving lectures in person um, before 2020. Um, it, it, so I'd give them a little uh, uh, spiel, then we'd do question and answers. And it was so fun, uh, Scott, because people would stand up and it'd be sort of like a revival meeting. And they yeah. would talk it. to the rest of the audience about their experience. Um, and they, they had not come to see me as a patient. They, they had just heard right. the lectures, had adopted the concepts, and, p- and a common theme was I'd spent tens of thousands of dollars in uh, IVF. We finally gave up, discovered Terry, implemented her diet. I've got three kids now. I had to get my tubes tied. <laughs> yeah. I love it. Yeah. I mean, we, this is the thing, right? We know that it's such a huge issue across the board. I mean, people just can't get pregnant as easily as they could 10 or 15 years ago, right. even especially a couple of decades. Uh, sperm quality is down. Um, quantity of sperm is down. So male side fertility is down. Uh, women have much more endometriosis. Uh, and so, uh, um, and I, I think, um, the endometrial lining is not as healthy. Uh, I think the eggs are not mm-hmm. as healthy. Uh, the tubes are more likely to be scarred. There are many female factors and male factors that. Uh, yeah, I mean, I think in, in underlying all of that probably to some degree is mitochondrial. Yeah, it's autoimmunity related. And then mitochondrial function yes. is where I was going, right? Because the eggs and sperm are one of the, the, the most highly, uh, I think, per cell, the number of mitochondria, I think, is the most in the eggs, actually, in, in all parts of your body. So it's hugely I did not know that, but it, but it makes sense. We, we'd have, we, yeah. They have to be packed because there's so much work they have to do f- from the very first, the very first moment uh, of uh, conception. Exactly. Yeah. So there, I mean, I've talked to a couple of fertility experts about mitochondrial function and they always want to tell me and remind me that the, the most mitochondria per cell are your eggs, interestingly enough. And then the sperm is not too far behind. But what I, what I love about your approach, Terry, is that like, you know, we talked about etiology and we talk about labs, but in the end you have these people that are just, you know, quote unquote, just following your diet and the things that you've had a lot of success on your own and seen massive benefit. And uh, on that side of things, I want to ask you a little about the diet stuff in the sense that um, I know that you were one of the things I, I, that I get, I get a lot of questions about from my patients now is um, anti-nutrients in plants oh, and, yeah, yeah, um, yeah, and yeah. also the, and also, and, and as a corollary to that, and I'd love you to discuss both is 
the nutrient density of our plants compared to like 50 years ago with vitamins, minerals, and nutrients and how it's even possible to see the, the benefits that you're having. And how do you, how do you, how do you respond to all that? Or how do you think about those things? Well, you know, we are what, uh, 98% of our genome is similar to chimpanzees that have a predominantly plant-based diet with, uh, a little bit of small uh, animals. Uh, and for millions of years, then we slowly evolve uh, from our uh, primates to, to the genus Homo, then Homo sapiens. And we were predominantly plant-based. We gradually had more and more meat, uh, more and more long bones, more omega-3s, uh, which let us grow this really big brain. Right. And we migrated out of Africa eating a wide variety of foodstuffs in a wide variety of ecosystems. And we have great success uh, in most of our um, hunter-gatherer societies have 100 grams of carbohydrates or less, somewhere between 50 and 100 is the most common. There are a few societies that are largely carnivore and have you know, only animal products, uh, meat, blood, milk, eggs, a little bit of honey. So yes, we 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 can eat a wide variety of things. We can, what we can't eat is processed, uh, westernized diet uh, and have good health. Because our species evolved eating plants, uh, those toxins in the plants, those anti nutrients, and they they are poisonous. Absolutely, I completely agree. They are poisonous in small doses. They are medicinal. In large doses, they would kill us. That is true for all of the medicines that we take. And all of the herbalists will tell you it's the dose that determines that this is poisonous to us or medicinal. So one of the things that I teach, Scott, is diversity. I want you to have 200 different plant species. I want you to, as much as I love kale, which is a great food, don't have it every day because then the poisons will get you. But if you rotate, you know, you have kale, you have turnip greens, you have beet greens, you have uh, parsley, you have cilantro, you have a wide variety of greens. Now they're going to be medicinal. And now you those... Did you say 200? 200. I'm sorry to interrupt. And this is a great family wow. activity because as soon as you say it's 200 and we're going to start keeping track, now you've got your kids on board now they're much more interested in trying new teas, new spices, new plants that show up at, at on the dinner table, new fruits that show up at the dinner table, because that gets to count for that 200. You could say, okay, mm, we're, we're going to try and have 10 new plants this month. Okay, that's a pretty interesting thing. Uh, and so that gets you up to 120. And now, like, okay, well, 10 was pretty easy. Maybe we could do 12 this month. And this, your kids will get on board with this. Even your teenagers would get on board with this. And then if you, and this is another wonderful task. Have them help you cook. And by the time mm. they're in middle school, they should be able to cook with a recipe. They, You can be the sous chef. They will love telling you what to do. And then when they're in high school, they can they can do it entirely on their own, or, or you can still be the sous chef. They'll love telling you what to do even more. And then when they go off and live independently, now that young person knows how to meal plan, how to grocery shop, how to use leftovers, and they are economically um, better able to control their destiny. They won't be mm. so beholden, so likely to just eat ramen noodles and boxed macaroni and cheese, ultra processed. So we know that ultra processed foods with uh, foods made from flour based cereals, pastas, grains, breads have higher rates of dementia, higher rates of cancer higher rates of autoimmunity, higher rates of infertility, higher rates of metabolic syndrome, prediabetes and diabetes, all terrible things that you do not want your children to have. And if you don't want them mm -hmm. to have that, you have to teach them how to cook. And that's only going to happen if you start doing it when they are children. 
young children. So do it when they're in elementary school. It should be part of their job to make a family meal when they're in uh, middle school. And it for sure should be a chore in high school. It, so what if they're busy doing sports? So what if they're busy doing theater? You got weekends. They can they can weekends. Cook, yep. cook for you on Saturday or Sunday. I love that. Yeah. Yeah, I think you you make a really good point. And of course, the nice thing about that is if you tell them that you'll do the dishes if they make dinner, they always like that too. So <laughs> at least in my house. Correct, correct. And, and um and I think it's <clears throat> very important that we give our children uh tasks, household tasks for running the household. Uh it makes our life easier, it makes their life easier. Uh and uh, we all, they all want to be useful. Yeah, I agree. And then it's the modeling of the behavior as we discussed, right? And so I, I love the idea of 200 in the variety and the diversity. And I think this is what you were meaning. So if you're using a variety of them, not just having kale every day, you're not going to get to the point where you're getting toxicity. It's more about you're going to be getting the benefits. Um, I think you've called it hormetic stress, Horm right? Hormetic stress. Uh, and uh, so yes, plants are poisonous. Absolutely, they are. Uh, and uh, everything in life is um, either medicinal or uh, toxic, even water. Water is medicinal or toxic. I, I, I took care of people who had poly, you know, psychogenic polydipsia and had stroke, them, yep. stroke themselves out. Now, you probably have too, Scott. Yep. Of course, yeah. And people with those, like there's a water drinking contest on, on radios killing people over the years. Yeah. Yep. So, in uh, air... We, we can uh, hyper, hyperventilate and uh, create uh, fainting uh, and paresthesias. Um, we can hold our breath and pass out. We can uh, do some uh, breath training uh, and induce some mild hypoxia, which, in fact, is hormetic stress, which turns out to be mm -hmm. actually quite good for us. Mm -hmm. Agree. Yeah. And so what is your thought also on the nutrient density of plants now, con considering the, well, the massive decreases? So nutrient density of plants, nutrient density of meat has declined uh, over the they last hundred years. Yes. Uh, and this has to do with a change in farming practice. Um, when I was a little girl in our farm in Northeast Iowa, we uh, rotated our crops. And right. then um, early on, uh, thanks to the uh, farm service and education of farmers, farmers started testing their soil and using more uh, anhydrous uh, uh, ammonia. Uh, so it put mm -hmm. more nitrogen in the soil. And then you would test your soil and you put in uh, particular minerals. I believe they would test. Um, well, there's a, once upon a time, I knew what minerals my dad was testing for. I no longer can recall interesting. those. Interesting. Um, that's that's okay. Yeah, interesting. Okay. Um, uh, certainly, uh, potassium, uh, phosphorus, uh, uh, but I'm, I'm not sure what else uh, was was being uh, tested for. And they would be sure. uh, putting those minerals. But of course, they're not testing for all of the minerals. And so right. the mineral content of our food has been steadily declining. And when the, uh, the USDA also measures the vitamin and mineral content of meat, of chicken, and of beef, and that has been declining. Right. So, and then the, the other thing I, I want people to, to know is um, there's very interesting, and this sort of makes sense, that the nutrient requirement to repair tissues when you have a chronic disease is higher than if you're healthy. So my nutritional needs as somebody with MS is much higher. And Scott, I'm going to assume that you're a healthy, vigorous young man. Uh, so I have hi higher nutritional needs uh, than you do. Uh, and we, we can't have, you know, nature doesn't, didn't have um, waste. So we never were able to eat a lot of sugar and white flour ultra processed food because those calories displace Calories that have nutrition, that have the amino acids, the vitamins, the minerals, that, and the cofactors that we need. And furthermore, <clears throat> uh, the FDA, um, uh, when we created uh, nutrient requirements for our vitamins and minerals, it was based on the technology that was available 100 years ago that could measure. Yeah, the RDAs, yep. 
yep. that could measure those particular vitamins and minerals. But of course, right. the nutritional requirements to run the chemistry of life are vastly more complex than what's listed in, that we have the RDAs for. Therefore, what, what I teach my practitioners and what I teach my patients is you don't have any empty calories if you want to be healthy. You have to eat things that have nutritional value. So you can't be eating flour-based products. You can't be eating sugary drinks. You, you can't be eating things with sugar in them. You got to be eating these radical things known as vegetables, these radical things known as berries uh, and some fruit, uh, the real starchy apples and pears and bananas, though they're delicious, too much starch, not enough nutrition. Berries are good. Non-starchy plants are good. Starchy plants, a little bit. I'd be very careful about how many of those you have. Um, and then you have to have plenty of protein. And most of us don't have enough right. protein. And that's a big one, right? I think on the protein side, you're, I think, a big fan of, of liver mm -hmm. in all the ways you can actually uh, put it and cook it and make it taste Man, pretty it good. It is really and, delicious. My, my, yeah. uh, our, our, one of our family's favorite meals is liver and onions. As a matter of fact, we're having that tonight. Excellent. And we'd make uh, liver pate. Uh, and so uh, here, here's a, another family favorite. You take a kale or collard leaves, you smear some liver pate on top of that, some guacamole on top of that, uh, and then uh, a squirt of hot sauce on top of that, roll it up and eat it. And so my kids would serve that to their friends, not tell them what it was, yeah, yeah, yeah. of course. <laughs> of and, course. and the friends would love it. <laughs> I love it. Yeah. So wanted to transition a little bit here and talk about, um, as a clinician, of course, and you mentioned this early on when we were talking, is that when you're starting to optimize people's vitamins, their minerals, their nutrients through their diet and through their lifestyle and getting them to eat more liver and more plants and less fortified foods and more just foods that have you know nutrients in them, which is different, right, yeah. than fortified, et cetera, you're going to have their blood pressure get better. You're going to see their psych issues change. Um, how are you thinking about managing medications, especially some of these disease modifying medications that they might be on? Yeah. Are, what is your process for that? How long do you think about taking them well, off or tapering? And so I, I tell patients, I want, I, I want to have a plan that takes three years to, to go from a highly um, uh, effective, because most of my folks come to me on highly effective drugs uh, that uh, if at the end of a year, they're doing really well. We're going to move them to a less effective drugs, uh, such as Copaxone. Uh, and they'll be on that for a year. Uh, and then uh, we will uh, lengthen the time that they're on the Copaxone, it, it, lengthen mm -hmm. the interval between injections and then off uh, by the end of the second year. Now, many of my patients, they feel really great. And they, uh, in the end, shorten that three-year time, time span. But by starting out with telling them that I'd rather this take three years, I can get them to at least take a year. Um, but I, and I really f feel uneasy. Uh, I, I stress, do not stop your disease-modifying, highly effective treatment until you've had a great result for a year. Because we know if you stop early, before we have mm. corrected the biochemical mischief, you will have a severe rebound. And your conventional doc will say, see, I told you the WALS protocol doesn't work. And I want to be on the ear scene. See, I told you, you can't do this that fast. Um, and then the other problem that we have is people, they get off their DMTs now. They're feeling great. MS is a dim nightmare in the past. They sort of forgotten that they ever had it. And now they're like, you know, that pizza and beer was so tasty. I'm out with friends. It looks so good. And I have some. I have a bunch. And it was so good. And then the next day I have another one. And then the day after that, I can't see again. Mm. And so I want to be in, uh, in the ear saying, see, I told you, you can never go back to the previous diet and lifestyle because you will activate all those disease processes again. And you've had this experience personally over the years too, yeah, I'm sure. You know, um, and so what, what happens is I still am very sensitive to gluten, dairy, and eggs. 
I, and so if I am traveling, and, and this was at a scientific meeting, uh, that a VIP dinner for all the speakers, I uh, thought everything would be fine. I told the server that I have a life-threatening reaction to gluten, dairy, and eggs. You'll be calling an ambulance. No, 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 not a problem. I assure you everything will be fine. The salad came out, and I thought, you know, looks like they have a commercial salad dressing on here, and I probably shouldn't. Oh, it's going to be fine. Well, it wasn't. <laughs> My general neurology turned on. It was miserable. Mm. Uh, and uh, that has happened. And then was it immediate? Uh, no, like immediate it, 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 it usually takes six to 24 hours and it took uh, 24 hours. Gotcha. Well, actually it took me 12 Makes hours. Yeah. Uh, and I woke up in the morning uh, and my trigeminal neurology was turning on. And then here's the other thing that I did. I normally carry prednisone with me. So if it turns on, I can start taking prednisone. I take 40 milligrams every hour until the, my trigeminal neurology is turned off. I had not every hour, every hour. And it takes wow. 250 to 300 milligrams. Holy shit. Wow. You know, okay. Yeah. But you know, if I, if I don't get it turned off, um, yeah, no, I got that. Then you know, I can you know get to where, the point you know where really. I can't talk because when I move my tongue, yeah. it triggers the, um, yeah. electrical jolt. And so I, I end up becoming nonverbal and being away from my family, mm -hmm. unable to communicate. That would be just like such a disaster. Yeah. I had not counted my, my pregnancy on tablets. I didn't have enough. So I went down in the morning, still um, in, in intense pain, um, but still able to communicate. So I was able to find a physician saying, you know, I'm having my trigeminal neurology. It's rapidly escalating. I'll soon be unable to talk. Uh, can you get me some more prednisone? Unfortunately, they could. And uh, I was able to get enough prednisone, right. get it turned off. Uh, and so... Got it. I now uh, will count my prednisone before every trip to be sure that I, would imagine. Uh, I have enough. Yeah. And then um, uh, at another scientific meeting uh, where you and I had our conversation, I got COVID. So I, I you did. came home uh, and started having a sore throat. I thought, hmm. So I started testing. It took two days to turn positive. Uh, and, but my, and my face pain turned on. So um, if I have a viral infection, my face pain will turn on. If I have gluten, dairy, or eggs, my face pain will turn on. Uh, but I can turn it off with the prednisone. Uh, and so Got it. I'd say about once a year. It's now, unfortunately, this year I've had it twice now. Uh, once was a diet exposure and once was uh, a virus exposure. Yeah, and it's interesting with the, with the viral exposure, right? Because we know that what that's going to do is... Do you depress your immune system function, right? Mm -hmm. And then as a result of that, you're going to get a resurgence of infl inflammation and dysregulation. So it sounds, yeah. And, and COVID is obviously something we've seen a lot over the last couple of years as a sort of manifester of these other types of illnesses like Epstein-Barr that you were talking about yeah. before. So I would imagine you've seen a significant, I, I guess, any any trends there that you've seen well, since COVID with MS? And, and that'd be interesting to know. Uh, so we, we know that COVID uh, is associated with a um, higher pseudo relapse rate that takes a much longer time uh, from which to recover. That will take months uh, to recover. Uh, and mm. uh, I am predicting that we're going to have many more other autoimmune diseases, more lupus, more RA, more inflammatory bowel disease, more Hashimoto's, and more MS, yeah. and more yes. uh, of the other neuroimmune disease, uh, NMO, neuromyelitis optica, uh, uh, myelin oligodendrocyte, uh, antibody-associated disease. Um, uh, so we're going to have a – we'll be busier. Yeah, that's, that's at least I've, I'm already seeing those trends, at least in my clinical practice as well, where people coming in with more autoimmune presentations, uh, issues that they maybe had when they were younger, and they've kind of resurged after having COVID and not getting better. A lot of the long COVID symptoms seem to be related to some of these yes. activations or the reactivations. Yeah, I, I think long COVID is really an autoimmune process, an activation of yeah. autoimmune processes in autoimmune yeah. disease states. You know, we, we, ha we yeah. actually have um, a, a couple of uh, studies uh, one of which is an evaluation of an online wellness program, uh, and we're using mm. it for uh, fibromyalgia, and we're now using it for long COVID. Uh, and mm. 
so we're slowly getting people uh, into uh, that that study. And I'm, I'm going to be very excited to see how, how that goes. Yes, yeah, so that's actually where I wanted to go now is, is talk a little bit about, you know, the, sort of your evolution of studies inside the world of MS and what you've done. And then, of course, talk about, I know you're recruiting for a current study now as well. So yeah. I want to make sure we do tell people about that. So, um, uh, well, send, if you have any MS patients, send them to terwalls.com forward slash MS study. We are recruiting people with relapse and remitting multiple sclerosis between the ages of 18 and 70. Uh, and they'll be randomized to either a ketogenic diet, uh, the modified uh, paleo diet, or usual diet. If they're following a therapeutic diet now, that's okay. They just have to be willing to come to Iowa and be willing to be randomized. So that if mm -hmm. they're in the walls diet already, that's fine. As long as they're willing to be randomized uh, and that they could go to the keto diet, if they're, that's what they're randomized to. If they're randomized to the paleo diet, they get to stay on the paleo diet. If they are randomized to the usual diet, they get to continue eating whatever they're uh, currently eating. Uh, if you are a vegetarian or a vegan, you have to be willing to eat meat. If you're in the keto diet, willing to eat meat or at least fish. If you're in the uh, um, paleo arm. And, you know, I guess you could do just fish in the keto arm as well. And I know uh, uh, there are a number of vegetarians that are uh, really more pescatarians. They're vegetarians, but they'll also eat uh, fish. Sure. And so in the, how is the study going to be designed in the sense you have these three arms, we have, you have the three usual. Arms. Uh, uh, and so people come to Iowa at, at month zero. Uh, we do all of the assessments, a bunch of patient report outcomes on mood, fatigue, quality of life, uh, clinical outcomes on walking hand, vision and working memory. And then we get a no contrast MRI and it's no contrast because we're able to get uh, with a bigger magnet, uh, all of the information that we need on enhancing lesions with just the magnet. Uh, yep. And th so the big question we're asking is, can it get people to healthy rates of brain volume loss? Because as a group, uh, and, and I'm in that group, those of us who have MS, as a group, our brains are shrinking 1% per year, which means, which is why we have higher rates of anxiety, depression, cognitive decline, frailty, and nursing home care. What does that compare to the average? Do you know the, as far well, as... Well, the healthy the, aging is 0.3% per year. 0.3%, okay. And so I'm asking, can I get people to 0.3%? And what percent of my study population can get to 0.3%? I'm very hopeful that the two intervention arms will get to 0.3%. And I think it's quite possible because the control arm, I'm giving tips every month on how to improve their diet. And people who want to be in diet studies want to improve their diets. So everybody does. I, yeah, I'm yeah. thinking that the control arm may well improve their diet and they may get to healthy rates uh, of brain volume loss too. And so if that's the case, how do you think you're going to be able to interpret the results if everybody, I mean, well, like, as you know. Oh, yeah. yeah so so uh, we're assessing the what people are eating at the baseline what they're eating at uh, the middle of the study and what they're eating at the end of the study. Uh, and so uh, we'll, we'll also know what kinds of diets people were following uh, at the beginning of the study, what kind of diet that they're following at the end of the study. And so we'll have to discuss what we see in the context of here's what people were eating at the beginning, here's what they were eating at the middle, here's what they're eating at the end. And sure. we either see that one of the two diets was really better than the other or not. Uh, and if we don't see the diets being better than the control diet, we'll have to explain that. Uh, and it'll be interesting. How many of my people yeah. are in the control diet are eating the standard American diet? Probably very few. Um, will, the, will they be mostly following the paleo diet? And so the, we have two paleo diet arms and a keto arm that we're comparing It'll be interesting. We, we don't know. Um, and, and I think the reality is because I've been so effective at championing the importance of diet to the MS community, we now mm. know that the majority of people when they're diagnosed with MS change their diet. And they're either doing the Mediterranean diet or the paleo diet. Those are the two diets right. that people are choosing. Uh, and so... Right. For the people like me who do diet studies, 
you won't be able to have a control arm that is the usual American diet because the control right. arms are all going to be saying, I got a bad disease. I'm fixing my diet, uh, which is good, which is exactly what I wanted to have happen. I want people with MS to know you got to fix your diet. Got it. And then the MRI scans, are they at the time zero and at three years? Are you doing anything in between? Uh, at time zero and at two years. Two years, and okay, we, we, gotcha. we do a two-year study to show people can follow the diet for that long and uh, that we can show uh, uh, changes in brain volume. Cool, very cool. So um, it'll, it'll, be the, slight... it'll be the largest, yeah. longest diet study with MRIs done to date. And how many people are you trying to recruit? 156. Until? I've got 122 randomized. Uh, we have another eight scheduled. Uh, we're trying, so we're looking for 26 more. Uh, and getting 156 uh, in two years is an extraordinarily ambitious schedule. I love that, and you're almost all the way there. Almost That's all amazing. the way there. Yeah, it's it's yeah. really quite amazing. Yeah. Yeah. So I had one um, slightly more personal question or biased question in the sense that I have seen you with some methylene blue yes, recently. Yes. Um, I, and just wanted to get your get your feel of, of of how methylene blue has been able to improve or affect you personally or how you've been using it in clinical practice. Uh, at all. So, I, I, you know, actually, the most interesting thing I've been giving to my dog uh, because he has an autoimmune issue and he's doing much better. Uh, I'm doing better. You know, and I think I uh, bounced back from the uh, COVID uh, much more rapidly because of the uh, methylene blue. Uh, uh, because, you know, people with MS and autoimmunity, and I'm 68, uh, I'm certainly in that uh, higher risk group for long COVID. So I'm, I'm very pleased. Sure. I don't have long COVID. I'm doing my, you know, aerobic workout. I did my strength workout with blood compression bands this morning. It was a, a big, hard workout. Uh, and uh, then I took my sauna and a cold plunge afterwards. So you're back to it. I love it. Okay. So my last question for you, we can make it quick is that we ask everybody at the end, the end of our podcast, what are the three ways that we can live smarter and not harder? Because that's the name of our podcast, the smarter, not harder podcast. So anything you can think of three ways that we all kind of improve our lives and live smarter and not harder. If you have ideas, uh, engage in gratitude, uh, engage, uh, in, uh, falling asleep with a positive thought towards yourself and your family. Uh, and uh, connect with people. Loneliness is profoundly inflammatory. Uh, and so these are all just behavior change things. They don't cost mm -hmm. anything other than your intention. I love that. Thank you, Terry. And since where can people find more about you and your work? And So go to terrywalls.com, T-E-R-R-Y, Walls, W-A-H-L-S.com. Uh, uh, follow me on Instagram, Dr. Terry Walls. Uh, and we also uh, have a, a practitioner training program, which we are upgrading mm. to include my uh, modules on remyelination, uh, behavior change, and uh, improving function, which is really vital for people with MS. That's amazing. We'll make sure we have all those links. So thanks so much for spending some time with us on a snowy day in Iowa. And I look forward to seeing you again sometime soon in a conference, I hope. Sounds great. Okay, bye, bye, bye. Thanks so much for tuning in to another episode of the Smarter Not Harder podcast, where we give you one cent solutions to $64,000 questions. I really hope you enjoyed this podcast with Dr. Terry Walls. If you have a friend or loved one that has MS, please send them to, their, to her website and get information. There's tons of information there. And as Terry delineated significantly during this podcast. So much of this can be done at very low cost, which is fantastic. If you like this episode, you like our podcast, don't forget to like and subscribe below. Please share with your friends and loved ones. That's how we reach more people. And we really appreciate your time and we hope you have a great rest of your day. <laughs>